is one of the most uh, uh, famous uh, conservancy in China and was of the world, maybe. Uh, Professor is executive director, Peking University Center for Nature and Society. He is honorary member, member of the China Association for Science and Technology. He's vice president of the China Women's Association for Science and Technology. She's also the advisory board member of the UND, uh, UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Uh, Professor Li Zi is a con convention, uh, conservation artist who is referred to have multiple disciplinary fields and deals with the complex sustainability issues for the Chinese society, as well as promoting China's for influence toward the world. The field projects he needs include the ecosystem service for forests and the grasslands, and natural history and the conservation strategies of endangered species, such as the chain panda, the snow leopard, the press makers, and the detecting blowing bear. In recent years, her work focused on the mechanism of community needs and the practical solution to the existence of wildlife and humans. Actually, like now, she is working in the field on the different platform. So maybe his singer is not so good. If there's some problem, I will just hear about this. Thank you very much. And I, I right now I just turn over to Professor Nitz. And you are searching. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peng, for the flattery Merci pour uh, cette uh, présentation. C'est un honneur pour moi d'avoir saisi cette opportunité et de rencontrer tout le monde à et d'interagir avec certains d'entre vous. Le sujet La question de la biodiversité et du changement climatique en Chine est très importante. Et on n'a pas fait assez, on n'en a pas parlé assez. Et cet atelier arrive à point. Et je suis très heureuse que ce, cette discussion ait lieu. Et au cours de l'année dernière, la, la, la photo qui affiche, qui s'affiche sur l'écran montre que les différentes sessions qui ont eu lieu et les conversations autour de la conservation de la nature et le changement climatique La rencontre de cet après-midi sera la première du genre en 2022. Et le sujet, le thème de cet atelier, atteinte l'atteinte des objectifs post-2020, synergie entre le climat et la biodiversité. Et nous savons tous qu'il y a une synergie entre les deux. Ce n'est pas pour dire que le climat va influencer la biodiversité de manière fondamentale, mais euh, les deux interagissent pour le maintien de la stabilité de l'écosystème. 
et pour assurer les moyens de subsistance des êtres humains pour les populations vivant en Chine et en Afrique. Je suis actuellement euh, dans je suis actuellement sur le mont de l'Himalaya. Mes excuses si ma connexion n'est pas très bonne. Euh, N'hésitez pas à m'interrompre ou à prendre la responsabilité de euh, de l'accueil de cette réunion. Alors, je disais, au niveau de, cette monde, de ce monde de l'Himalaya, les moyens de subsistance des populations dépendent largement de la nature. À l'échelle mondiale, plus de 50 du PIB dépend directement ou indirectement de la nature. Alors, par conséquent, sans la nature, les humains ne pourront pas expérimenter des conditions de vie stables. Et le climat est l'une des conditions pour assurer la stabilité de la nature. Comment est-ce donc possible d'établir cette synergie sur le terrain? Comment les acteurs qui travaillent sur le changement climatique et la biodiversité peuvent travailler pour réduire la crise de la biodiversité? Je crois que nous parlons plus que nous n'agissons. Et j'espère que cet atelier, ce webinaire, va proposer de nouvelles façons de penser, de nouveaux exemples pour que les exemples, les actions futures soient prises. Cela dit, nous avons quatre intervenants qui vont partager leurs idées avec nous au cours des prochaines heures. Nous allons commencer par la session, la première session, et le premier intervenant sera le docteur Peng Chuan, qui a, il aura 20 minutes pour parler. Center for Climate Change Strategy and International Cooperation in China. Uh, he's a professor and his research interests include climate change policies, global climate governance, multi multilateral gov environment agreements, um, and so on. He has personally in, not only did done research on the, these subjects, but also had heavily involved in negotiations and the reviews um, on the uh, current ongoing UNFCCC uh, uh, negotiation and CBD negotiation. So he's uh, working in the front line when we talk about global uh, biodiversity framework. He will, be, he will be the person to help us to understand better and uh, interpret what uh, that means on the ground and for different countries, perhaps. Um, so let's welcome Dr. Gao Xiang to give his presentation. Please, Dr. Gao Xiang. So thank you, thank you, Professor Liu, and uh, good afternoon to the Chinese colleagues and good morning to our African colleagues. Um, it is my great pleasure to to be here and uh, to have the discussion with um, Pauling, with Kang, and our. Uh, African sisters and brothers. Um, please allow me to share my screen. Yeah, here we go. So um, 
I, I think the synergies between the climate and the biodiversity is um, recognized by more and more people, as Professor Lee just introduced. And generally, I think we know like the biodiversity loss and also like this ecosystem degradation will result in the increasing of greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the decreasing of carbon sinks, which will further result in the climate change. And then as a result of climate change, we will get further biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. So we need to take actions to enhance the synergies between climate change as, and, as well as the biodiversities. And some of the key concepts or actions we already have, and especially during our negotiation, like the eco-based approaches, the nature-based solutions, the REDD, which means reducing the emissions from deforestation and the forest degradation. However, today I'm not going to share about the actions and policies themselves. I think the other experts later will share their views on that. And I would like to share my understanding on the procedural aspects of the global governance on both the climate change and biodiversity. And from, from the concept, um, I think we all highlight the climate change and the biodiversity present measures as well as their synergies. And then the next step, after we have this uh, concept, we need to turn them into action. And also we need to achieve the progress. So that's why I think a system to provide information, transparency, and to facilitate the countries and also the non-state actors to enhance their responsibility is very crucial. And that is why under both UNFCCC and under the CBD negotiation, we have and we are enhancing the, 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 the framework of the transparency. So this is a, a, a general picture of the theory of change of the post-2020 um, GBF, the Global Biodiverse, Biodiversity Framework as introduced by the uh, co-chairs of the OEWG negotiation. And this picture shows that we, are going, we have this um, long-term vision and we have the 2015 goals and we also have some missions which generally echoes to the 2030 targets and to achieve these targets, whether it's as a tool or as the solutions or to reducing those threats to biodiversity or to meet the people's needs from biodiversity, we have some enabling condition. And during the negotiation, we have three categories of this condition. One is um, what we call means of implementation. In fact, that uh, means the finance, technology transfer, as well as capacity building especially the support to developing countries. And also some enabling conditions, including the engagement of all um, stakeholders. And also one of the section is talking about responsibility and transparency. This is what I just uh, um, highlights that we need this system to share with the uh, international society. We are not just saying, but we are doing and we are achieving. And for this responsibility and transparency framework under the uh, negotiation of the CBD, uh, we can we, we, we call it a multi-dimensional review approach. Um, and so in fact, we are not starting from, from zero. We have some existing arrangements under the CBD, which are, for example, the Article 6 of the Convention says that all, each party shall develop their national biodiversity strategies and action plans which will introduce to the other others uh, in international society what you are going to do to fulfill your um, obligation under the convention. And also we have the national reports as requested by Article 26, which means that you are not, you are regularly to report on the progress, regularly on, 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 on the policy and measures you have taken and what are the achievements, the progress you are, you are, you are having. And also since the um, uh, last COP, the COP 14, we have formally established the two mechanisms to share our, okay. our, our experience. Et nous avons les forums, uh, ouverts, uh, ended forum. 
where parties can discuss with each other to share their good practices, to try to help each other identify those challenges and obstacles and how to, to, to um, um, get rid of these um, um, obstacles and to, move better, to, to enhance better. And based on this existing arrangements during the negotiation right now, what we have last month in Geneva, we have formulated our uh, draft of the new um, uh, review uh, framework uh, under the GBF, which we, we include uh, 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 five parts. The three parts, the first three parts are regarding to the process, which uh, are relevant to first the, uh, the plan. Um, for example, we have, to, after we adopt the after we adopt the uh, GBF, the Global Biodiversity Framework, we have the, the global target, and then we will um, try to establish, I mean, all the countries establish their own national targets. Of course, we have to have these countries to, uh, to take actions, otherwise we can't achieve the, the global target. So each country will uh, introduce their national targets and this will be communicated through the NDSAPs, um, just to mention the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans. And also we will make use of the headline indicators. As well, we will report on the progress, use the uh, national reports, and also we, in, we will continue to use the uh, review mechanism as uh, established. Besides, we are right now discussing whether we also need to have a global review, which means we need to globally to to see um, what are the progress we, we, we made. This is because uh, we are uh, having these lessons learned from the IG target, because uh, as maybe many of the colleagues here, we know that we established IG target for the um, global goal of 2020, but um, there is kind of lack of uh, progress monitoring. So after, when we, when we reach the 2020, we finally find, oh my God, we haven't, it's much progress on that. So by, by taking this lessons to, um, we try to establish the, pro, the, the process that regularly we will take stock of first the national the national countries will report on the progress and then we will see what are the collective progress, how much we still um, far from our, our global goals. So this is a kind of a new idea we are going to introduce. In, in the uh, negotiation. But of course, this is a negotiation. We have to get everyone agreed on, on such kind of mechanism. And besides these three uh, mechanisms, we also uh, uh, highlight the two very important cross-cutting um, aspects. The first one is the participation of all stakeholders, not only the country, but all the stakeholders, including like the IPLCs, um, like the um, NGOs and others. And we also uh, highlights that the support to developing countries is extremely important because when lack of this um, finance technology capacities, the developing countries even know they can set very ambitious targets, but without such kind of means of implementation, they cannot get any progress. Then it doesn't make sense for the international society and it doesn't make sense for the global uh, governance. So these are the framework of uh, what we are negotiate. Um, for un under the uh, GBF, the post 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, this, um, I, I would next to introduce the uh, situation under the climate change, um, uh, global uh, climate governance. You will see it's quite similar to the, to the uh, CBD um, arrangement. They are in fact learning, mutually learning from each other. So this is the general feature of the Paris Agreement as we know. Um, there are uh, uh, 29 articles um, in the Paris Agreement. We have the uh, first part of the foundation, which uh, make it very clear the Paris Agreement is not to replace the UNFCCC, but it, it is in pursuit of the ob objectives of the Convention. And also the Paris Agreement is guided by the principles of the Convention, including like say, principle of equity and common but differentiated responsibilities and the respective capabilities. And, and so on. And then the Paris Agreement sets its own objectives. You can, you can see this is similar, you, you can understand it in such a way that it's similar to the GBF, the global goals and targets of the GBF. Here we call the objectives of the um, Paris Agreement. 
And then under the Paris Agreement, we have some um, substantive obligations, uh, many uh, into uh, two categories. One is action um, for climate to, to, to address climate change. Usually we say we have adaptation and also mitigation. And on the other hand, we highlight the means of implementation, which includes finance, technical transfer, and capacity building. And um, um, another category is a procedural arrangement. And here we have the transparency, we have global slow take, and also facilitating implementation and promoting compliance. Here we see it's different from which I just introduced under the uh, CPD. In fact, the global slow take is a separate um, element under the Paris Agreement. It's, it is not included as a, as a broader transparency. But under the CBD, we include the transparency of action and support and the global stock take, either call stock take or review or analysis together as a package of the uh, transparency and the responsibility arrangement under the CBD, under the negotiation. Um, for the transparency of action and support under the UNCCC, in fact, we have a very long time in involvement um, from the first starting of the UNCCC, the developed countries, well, in fact, both developed and developing countries has the obligation for national communication, which means that you have to, all the parties, you have to, you must report on your progress uh, made towards the uh, achievement of the ultimate objectives of the convention, what you are doing and what you plan to do. What are the lessons learned? What are the challenges you face? What are the needs you, you are searching for? Um, but however, if you look at this uh, table, you will see from the first beginning, um, the first phase uh, rec records a, a significant fabrication phase. Uh, during that period, the developed country and developing country are taking quite different approaches for this transparency reporting and review. That is because we, we, we know developed country and developing countries are taking different his, his, historical responsibilities to climate change and also their capabilities are quite different. So developed countries are taking the lead. And then go to the second phase, mm -hmm. we call it the um, symmetric bifurcation. And that is starts from 20, 2011 uh, until um, next to, uh, until, until uh, 2024, in fact, um, the developed countries and developing countries are doing similar things. And then under the past agreement, which will start from the 2024, or uh, both developed countries and developed countries are enhancing their transparency um, under the same under the common provisions with differentiation, especially for developing countries, they will have flexibility because they are, uh, are not have the same uh, level of capacities with developed countries. So you will see that under the UNCCC, we have a very long, even almost almost 30 years involvement of the transparency framework. So that is why under the uh, UNCCC, we, um, think we have quite a lot. And right now, um, some of the good practices are, are, are borrowing or are sharing with the CBD negotiation. However, we do not expect that they, under the CBD, everyone can do immediately the same as they are doing under the UNCCC. Because well, even though we have some existing arrangement of practice under the CBD and the capacity of every country are quite different. Um, another kind, another very important uh, um, concept here is the uh, raise of ambition. Uh, everyone is saying that we need to raise our ambition both under the uh, climate change and also the biodiversity. And there is a circle in, in the center. Um, please forgive me that I'm going to take the uh, temperature test every day um, right now in the, in, in the quarantine. Um, later uh, when it knocks the door, I have to go to the temperature test, but I'll come back very soon. Um, the circle, the, this circle is introduced in the negotiation of the um, climate change. Um, the idea is that every country provides their intended national determined contribution. Please forgive me.
I'm back. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the concept is that every country first provides their intended nationally determined contribution, and then we will have the face of the uh, international connotation, and after the connotation, you will formally set your nationally determined contribution, and then you go to uh, implement that, you get progress, and then we have the global stock take. Based on information of global stock take, we will know how, whether there is a gap uh, for the global um, efforts, and then you will update your um, de national determined contribution. However, um, during the negotiation, parties are not agreed on this international connotation because many parties feel that the national determined contribution is my national sovereignty. I, I, can, I cannot allow uh, others to finger point on my, on my um, national determined Deter determination and on national policies. So because the, internet, uh, the multilateral agreement is kind of international law treaty, it, it must be based to respect the national sovereignty. So in fact, under the Paris Agreement, we don't have this full cycle. We only have an NDC, national determined contribution, and then we will implement, have progress and global stock take, and then another round. So just this one. Um, of course, we understand the um, the gaps for this uh, for this NDC, those national targets towards what is needed for the uh, global efforts, because um, like the global target is sometimes kind of put hope. We wish to achieve that, uh, especially when we do the um, scientific research, we have the modelings, we have the scenario analysis, and this is based on some scenarios, not based on the realities, in fact. So there would be some gaps between these scenarios and the realities. Uh, th th this, this is not a strange thing, it's quite common. Um, however, we would like to highlight that um, the ambition is not only the ambition of this national target, as I just mentioned. If, for example, developing countries, they, they set a very ambitious target. However, they don't have the technology, they don't have the finance to implement may that make sense. So when we say the ambition, it must be the ambition which is um, achievable. Um, so we, we can also have some uh, cases um, on, the, on, the, um, on, on the right side. This shows that the uh, target set by developed countries for uh, 2020 and also show the progress of the 2019, which, uh, and this target was set in 2010, which means after nine years, how much they have achieved for their uh, national targets of 2020. We can see for like Australia, it's close. Although we have spent nine years, we haven't uh, achieved like, like say 90% of the progress. For US, uh, well, it's just like say 60% of progress compared with uh, they have spent 90% of time. However, we also see like the uh, New Zealand and uh, um, they, they haven't get any emission reduction, but their emission is still increasing. So this is kind of um, um, what we're concerned that you, you can, of course, everybody can say it and announce, make a very ambitious pledges on the emission reduction. However, if they do not make any progress, like, like Canada, almost a non-progress, it, 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 will, it will be, there, there, it, it is not good for this uh, international society and not good for our to achieve our target. And another aspect is, in fact, if you look at the, what IPCC told us in 2007, before these developed countries set their targets, IPCC said developed countries, they need to reduce their emission compared with 1990 by 25 to 40%. But if you see this, uh, the green bars, none of them, is falling to the range of 25 to 40. And this, this target, this emission reduction is only for two degrees centigrade emission, uh, uh, temperature control. Not to say that right now we are looking for 1.5. So which means that the effort made by developed countries until 2020 is far not enough for their, for their fair share. And also another, another aspect is in fact their their baseline for this emission reduction is different. For example, like Japan, their, base, their baseline is for the year 2013, which is the 
peak year, the highest emission year of of Japan, that's in 19, 1990. So we, we see that the, their target, in fact, is not um, good enough. So um, come to the uh, very quick conclusion. I think first, the, uh, I, I just taken this word from the uh, most updated IPCC AR6 report um, uh, is, issued uh, early this month. And they said in their report, the inter internationally agreed process and goals including transparency requirement for national reporting on emission actions and support and tracking progress are enhancing international cooperation, national ambition and the policy development. So which means that IPCC acknowledged that the transparency framework is very important for the global governance. And also there has been a long-term evolution of the transparency rules under UNCCC and CBD both and the key underlying enabler, in fact, is the capacity of each country. And the transparency rules under the UNCCC could be a reference to the CPD negotiation right now, but could not be copied to. And the um, other uh, aspect is about ambition. Um, so based on a previous explanation, we feel the ambition, which in fact means uh, uh, three things together, ambition of targets or pledges, and the ambition in progress of implementation, as well as ambition in means of implementation. Only by three of them as a, as a holistic um, integrity, then we can achieve the ambitious um, goals of the uh, whole society. So we don't and we can't waste time on just bargaining on the scenarios but we need actions and we also need to see progress. And um, thank you so much for um, your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gao. It's very informative and uh, thoughtful. Uh, transparency is apparently a key issue for the uh, money for uh, 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 the governance of um, governance of conventions um, and the supervision on the achievements actually. But of, of, of course, there are many um, subjects related to that and biodiversity, um, transparency on, on biodiversity uh, achievements, um, so we usually call it MRV in the uh, UN, under FCC, UNFCCC framework. Uh, has been an issue that's been discussed a lot in, in the CDD discussion, but uh, there are also many difficulties we encounter, for example, what indicators to, to introduce and uh, what monitoring system, who does monitoring and uh, who supports it financially, especially in the developing countries and, and uh, you know, human resources also lacking database is not sufficient and so on. But nevertheless, these are important issues that, that have to be built from now. Otherwise, we'll never go to where we want. Um, so the reason why we have the discussion of these challenges is because it, there, is, there are gaps existing. Um, so thank you for to Mr. Gao and uh, uh, sharing with that with us your thoughts and also uh, experiences uh, and lessons learned from UNFCCC to see what, um, if we can become smarter when we talk about GBF. Thank you. And our next speaker is Pauline Natungo Kalunda, I hope I pronounced it correctly, from Uganda. And, uh, and, and the executive director of an organization called Eco Trust. Um, Dr. Ms. Pauline is the executive director of Eco Trust, which is an environmental con conservation trust of Uganda. Uh, she's an expert in establishing and managing in innovative conservation financing mechanisms, which is very, very important today, today because there is a, such a huge finance gap in biodiversity conservation globally, especially in the developing countries. 
Among her first uh, several achievements, uh, Pauline has successfully established a commercially viable payment for environmental services scheme. It's called Trees for Global Benefit, TGB, um, which links smallholder farmers to the voluntary carbon market. And this, uh, the TGB won the 2013 Seed Award in its innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, let's welcome Pauline to uh, share with us her experiences and innovation in linking the uh, carbon and biodiversity conservation. Please, Pauline. You may start. Did everyone hear me? Can you now hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much. So, yes. Um, good afternoon to the colleagues in China and uh, good morning to the colleagues in, in Africa. So I was requested to share with you um, experiences or even opportunities that lie, uh, that come from the synergies uh, between climate change and uh, biodiversity conservation. Next. Sharon. Um, the, the relationship between climate change and biodiversity and in the context of Africa, that relationship cannot be separated from the relationship with livelihoods. So from our perspectives in the African context, it is a nexus between biodiversity, climate change, and livelihoods. And it's, it's, it's an impact dependency relationship where very healthy ecosystems have a wealth of biodiversity in, in them, but they also have an ability to store carbon dioxide and also support economies. They support businesses and they support our livelihoods. Africa has a, a growing population and its survival depends on the ecosystems, our subsistence agriculture, source of, of um, safe drinking water. We depend on the products that we harvest from our ecosystems, that our food comes from the ecosystems and our overall food security is really dependent on, um, on these ecosystems. So basically losing biodiversity results into um, loss of the ability to maintain these climate services at the same time, prevents our ability to, to achieve our livelihoods. And when it prevents, when our ability to achieve our livelihoods is, is, is reduced, we will clear more forest or we will clear more biodiversity in, 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 in pursuit of livelihoods. And then thus we just go into this vicious cycle of climate induced risk, cutting, destroying vegetation to, to be able to defend ourselves and then making it worse and the cycle goes on and on. And because we are so close and our dependence is so related to the, to the ecosystem in almost its natural form, even the impacts and the risks of climate change are felt hard, hardest and first to communities in the global south. Next, um, Sharon. However, this can this dependency and impact impact and uh, dependency can be turned around to be an opportunity, an opportunity whereby if interventions are very well measured and interventions are very well targeted and calculated, every intervention can be utilized 
to gain what they call a triple win, whereby the same intervention can contribute to the post-2020 global biodiversity um, objectives, it can contribute to the nationally determined contributions that uh, the previous speaker has been talking about, but that intervention can also, that same intervention can also be used to achieve the sustainable development goals. So basically addressing the synergies between mitigating biodiversity loss and climate change while considering social impacts offers us an opportunity to maximize on the benefits and be able to meet the global development goals both within the post 2020 biodiversity, I mean, within the post 2020 biodiversity framework, within the UNFCCC, as well as within the FDGs, if every intervention is very well uh, targeted. And I'm going to share with you an example on how we have done it um, here at, with the Environmental Conservation Trust of Uganda. Next. So the way we have done it at, at Ecotrust, we have understood that the main challenge has been the, the threats that arise from that interdependency. Because people are so busy trying to survive within this very rapid changing climate and uh, rapid degradation, they don't have the ability to, to think long-term. Everybody's thinking about what will I feed my children next season? How will I take my children to school? How am I going to, 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 to remain healthy? How will I be able to access my basic needs? So everybody is caught up into that web that people are not able to think long-term. So they resort through short-term uh, resource user utilization decisions that just escalate this whole um, cycle. So what we have done is we have created a model which is a blended financing model, which is a model that goes to the biodiversity market, to the climate change market, and to the livelihoods, uh, to the SDG market, and whatever financing is accrued from those um, sources is targeting to transform the investment horizons from, for, of, of the landowners. And in Uganda, the majority of landowners are smallholder farmers, like 80% of the private landholders in Uganda are smallholder farmers that are using it for subsistence agriculture. So what we do, we get, we get this financing and we, we first get financing from donors. So when we get the financing from, from donors, we deliver it into the landscapes to be able to, to support the, the community to come up with a vision on how they see themselves in the next 25, 50 years. And then they we quantify the interventions that can be used to achieve that vision. And then we quantify the environmental services that will come from that vision and then commoditize them. And the money that we use when we sell those environmental services is the money that we bring back so that the communities can invest in the interventions they identified themselves. So now, by the time we are in, in, in the third year, now that every, every household that works with us has developed a land use plan, and they've also developed a business plan, but also they are members of, of village savings and loans associations. They open up bank accounts in those uh, village banks. So then the way we deliver the performance-based payments that come from the sale of environmental services, we deliver them in a manner that creates a credit history for those farmers to make them um, qualify to access loan financing. So by the time they are in between year three and year nine, they can use the, the agreement, the, the sale agreement that they have with us, the, payment for environmental services sale agreement that we have with us, they can use it for collateral. Before that, they don't have any means of collateral because even though they own land, it is not a requirement in Uganda to have documentation that confirms that this land is yours. So you own the land, but you don't have any documentary evidence. So you can't use that land as collateral for, for loan. But now when they enter into
Pauline seems to be disappeared. Professor Lu, so uh, please follow this part and do some comments. I don't, even okay. Please, I don't know where I stopped. Anyway, um, land, so land tenure, you talk about land tenure. Uh, how okay. to yeah yeah and and so they are able to use the purchase agreements they have with us to access loans and by the time they are in year 10 they are now able to gain uh income from the sale of the products from the investments they made in land so that way everybody has a long-term agreement every every everybody has a long-term investment horizon and this inv long-term investment horizon allows for the for sustainable land use, it allows for the inclusion of trees, it allows for biodiversity conservation, and in the end, they also build their resilience towards climate change. Next. And I'm going to show you an example of a landscape of how it, okay, the way we mobilize financing from private sector, we, we have three different options or opportunities for mobilizing financing. Like I said, the relationship between biodiversity, economics, and climate change is an impact dependence relationship. So private sector understand that. Private sector that, well, this is an example of a, a, a fast food chain that is based in Sweden that, that offsets its, its carbon footprint through um, our activities. And um, the, the, the way we work, the way we work with them is that every year, they measure how much carbon dioxide on a voluntary basis, how much carbon dioxide they release into the atmosphere as a result of their activities. And remember on our side, we said we have developed this vision where the communities um, determine the interventions that they would like to do on their land. So as Ecotrust, we quantify the carbon benefits, the carbon emission reduction benefits that are going to come from those activities, those sustainable land use activities, which are also biodiversity conservation activities. We quantify those carbon benefits, and then we work with this private company to offset their emissions through the landscape. So they, they, every ton of carbon that they've quantified, they turn it into a dollar value, and we give it directly to the communities, to the households that are planting the trees, that are managing the land, which is reducing the emissions. And then the other way that we work with private sector we help private sector to understand that their value chains will be made more resilient if land is managed in a certain way. So when once they understand that, then they identify investment opportunities within that value chain, and they give that money directly to the smallholders that are, that are part of the supply chain to invest in those, um, in those uh, initiatives. And the way they do it is this, 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 this burger chain in, in Sweden, every burger they sell, its carbon footprint is indicated. And the price of this burger includes the price of the, the tons of carbon that are accrued from this. So every year they sell the burgers, as they sell the burgers, they make an account of how much money they have accrued from every burger that has been sold, and they send it back into uh, the, the landscape that 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 um, that they, they are offsetting through. Then the other the other engagement that we have with private sector is about responsible sourcing to recognize that the farmers that manage their land sustainably, there is an extra investment or there is an opportunity cost that has come out of those investments, and therefore instead of buying cheaper options simply because they didn't have to undertake those, op those investments. They need to prioritize sourcing from our landscapes because the products that come from our landscapes have been sustainably produced. So the, the combination of having income that is coming from offsets and having income that the private sector partner is, is adding by uh, identifying opportunities within the value chains and also having a guaranteed access to the market 
for sustainably produced products is what makes the value proposition to the landowner to be able to manage land, land that way. And it is also what gives value proposition to the private sector to continue giving money and engaging with this landscape because they also benefit from it. They realize that they have an impact on the environment and that impact has been turned into uh, environmental services units, carbon credits, biodiversity uh, credits, Just water. Yeah. It has been we are waiting for Karim to um, next slide. So this is this next okay, this is what an example of a landscape looks like. Um, in in it, a few years ago, like 50 years ago, this was one big block of forest. But over the years, only the 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 the, the, the sections that are in, in, in green are remaining as forest. But this is a very rich biodiverse area. It, 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 it accommodates chimpanzees and the, they, they are, there is wildlife that migrates between the large blocks of forest. Now, when wildlife is migrating between the large blocks of forest, it goes on to people's homes and, and there's human wildlife conflict and there's a lot of fight. So over, we, we, we have created a landscape action plan those red marks that you see are the areas that we have identified that they need to co that connectivity needs to continue existing for wildlife to be able to migrate in between the large forest blocks. And when wildlife is able to migrate between the large forest blocks, then you will be able to deal with human wildlife conflict. Then you'll be able to also deal with food security because people will not be losing their crops to to to, to wild animals, but also you will be able to continue uh, having a sustainable supply of water in the landscape. And also you'll be able to continue having a, a sustainable agriculture within the landscape. So we also identify the different incentives. We identify the threats. We identify the different incentives that are required to address those threats. We also identified the reasons why we are investing is for sustainability, sustainable supply chain, is for water catch, catchment management, for wildlife corridors, for biodiversity conservation, for climate change mitigation, and also for climate change adaptation. So any investment that we have in this area will achieve that long list of management objectives that you put on the side. But also those management objectives can be converted into monetary value so that it's that income that is used to meet these incentives that are required down here to be able to, to have the overall investment um, take place. Next. And with those, with those, okay, if you could go back. So, and with all those interventions, we've been able to improve the adaptive capacity of 15,000 households. We've been able to reduce 2.2 million tons of carbon dioxide, and we've raised more than 10 million US dollars strictly from private sector, not, not from public sector, not from donors or anything, but as foreign direct investment for farmer led forestry. We've been able to create other area-based conservation uh, measures. We have three private reserves, we have 10 community reserves, and we have more than 10,000 hectares under agro biodiversity. We have every household that we work with is an economic unit that has an enterprise with a land use plan, with a business plan, and we also have 32,000 hectares that we are managing throughout all these community initiatives that we have. The last slide. And this is where this this is this this is where the, the money that has has come from from private sector from all the private companies and it's coming from all over the world. We also have partnerships with uh, with other international NGOs and basically we've been able to mobilize resources from all sources. We've been able to mobilize financing from all sources and every penny that comes into our hands achieves the three objectives: biodiversity conservation, climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as sustainable livelihoods. Thank you very much. Um, great. Thank you, Pauline. I myself dropped out for, for a few minutes and um, 
Um, but I've, uh, I have uh, read uh, most of the uh, presentations by Pauline, and it's a great example to indicate how for at uh, the grassroots level, the uh, businesses, the, the uh, local communities and NGOs could work, work together to a sustainable um, model to, uh, to produce the synergy, not only to um, climate change and biodiversity, but also livelihoods of the, the community benefits. So it's a triple benefits, multiple benefits. I think for all the activities on the ground, whether it's climate or uh, biodiversity, this, uh, this synergy, the triple benefits uh, should be a standard, in fact. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I would like to suggest that everyone um, to not forget to save your question because we will have a discussion session after all the presentations uh, is complete, uh, completed. We'll have half an hour um, to, to uh, discuss. So please save your questions. Well, the next speaker, um, sorry, the next speaker is we we'll shifted um, Dr. Lin's um, presentation to toward the end because she has other things to handle. So Dr. Kainka uh, Senna will be the next one to talk to us. Um, Miss Dr. Senna is an indig indigenous people from Kenya uh, who is a PhD in Indigenous people law and policy from the University of Arizona. Um, then he returned to Kenya, uh, became, who be, uh, became a, a faculty of law in Egerton University in Nairobi. Um, he has been a regional representative uh, of East Africa, uh, acted as IPACC. Um, and in the career built around indig indigenous people and issues, who ha he has served, served as a member and chairperson of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, um, which is a member of African Commission Working Group on Indigenous Populations. And, and he, in the meantime, he has been consulted for various organizations, including World Bank, um, and the UN uh, RED program, Conservation International, and so on. So, uh, so obviously, we can, from his experiences, we can tell that um, he has a rich, uh, rich knowledge and insights on how indig indigenous people could be involved in the issue we are now talking about, the climate and the biodiversity. Uh, at the different levels, local, national, and international levels. Um, so let's welcome Ms. Uh, Dr. Senna to start his presentation, please. Hello. You could share your screen. Um, Dr. Son Senna seems to have lost his connection for a bit. We are yes, checking Dr. in Senna. with him directly because he's based out of Nairobi. Um, per perhaps we could take um, a few questions from you as the moderator, uh, Professor Drew, as we wait for um, Dr. Senna to come back on. Okay, great. We have to be flexible with our schedule um, due to the time difference and technology different uh, 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 difficulties, challenges. Um, well, I have a question for Paul.
normally it is at the mm -hmm. so for us we have understood that however much you 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 have however much money you have if you have not identified what the barriers are and what the vision of the community is you will not be able to achieve these objectives but if you can understand what the vision of the community is and then identify the barriers that are preventing this farmer to be able to walk towards that vision in a manner that achieves biodiversity and climate change. Once you have understood that, then you're able to target your financing to be able to remove those barriers. Thank you. The last word. How about the scale? In the business involvement usually require certain scales. Um, yes. To to, to become profitable. But yes. the small landowners uh, often have difficulties to build yes. product. So yes. how do you, you know, connect the both? The way we deal with scale, we deal with it from the numbers. Because when, when, we, when we develop a vision, it is not for one smallholder, it is for thousands of smallholders. So you're working with tens of thousands of smallholders, and if 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 you and and so therefore you pr you provide you create an aggregation platform. So so you're able to get supplies from very many smallholders, even from even if when it comes to climate credits, still one still one um sub, one buyer wants a certain volume, and if you work with just one smallholder, you not be able to achieve that to, to, to match supply with demand. So we have a platform through which we aggregate everything. We aggregate actions, we aggregate smallholders, we, but also sometimes you can oversupply. So you can mobilize mm -hmm. too many smallholders that you don't have enough bucket. So we aggregate smallholder actions, but we also aggregate buyers. So we have created this exchange platform where we have multiple buyers, but we also have multiple um, uh, smallholders that are in diverse fields. But we aggregate, we aggregate for coffee, for cocoa, for vanilla, for, for shea butter. There is an aggregation platform that gives a platform uh, 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 opportunities for many smallholders all over the country. Thank you, Pauline. That's excellent. And uh, there's a question for Dr. Gao Xiang from Penghui um, that he would like to know that uh, in the current CBD negotiation, uh, what's the difficulties of including climate issues in the discussion? For example, why is MBS, the nature-based solution, um, is not currently included in the global biodiversity from framework. I think it's called the ecosystem-based solution. So we use a different terminology. So what's the consideration behind? Well, th thanks, Professor Liu, and also thanks for the, for the question raised by uh, Dr. Peng. Um, in fact, right now, we are using the term in both NBS and EBA um, in the uh, negotiation text. However, uh, both of them are in brackets. <laughs> Uh, which means that we, we have to decide whether to choose one of them or none of them or both of them. The, the problem right now- see many, now... many brackets in this uh, <laughs> document. Yes, always, always. That is the negotiation. Um, I, I think right now the problem is that even though like the Union 5 give the definition of NBS and give some kind of uh, boundary, of uh, like NBS shall not provide, uh, shall not result in adver adverse impact um, on others. Um, although we have this kind of definition, however, some of the parties still feel that NBS, um, if handled improperly, it will in fact um, have adverse effect on biodiversity and also the ecosystem. So this is something we need to uh, discuss to provide more um, scientific uh, uh, um, proofs and also um, to try to so try to see if parties can go along with the introduced new concept of NBS into the uh, CBD negotiation. Because like the 
ecosystem-based approach. This EBA is a term has been used for, for more than decades or uh, under the CBD, but the new term uh, NDS, um, many of the colleagues still have some concerns on that. So this is kind of negotiation. Uh, regarding to the presentation of, of Pauline previously, um, I, I think the uh, EcoTrust in Uganda has made a very good job um, because we have, um, it's not the only the synergy between climate change and uh, biodiversity conservation, but also I think the most important thing is the livelihood, which improved the li livelihood of the local society. I think this is something, I think in China, we also have this similar um, concept that the, we, 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 we put, should have Fuping, how to say, a little bit of a similar thing. We, we have a similar thing, and uh, I think we should look. poverty elevation. <laughs> Great. <laughs> this is the expert. I, I, I think we should uh, learn from each other how, how this works. I think the EcoTrust make a very good um, platform um, by especially matching the, the supplier and the um, consum consumption side. Um, my, my question, in fact, is that besides, uh, my question to Pauline is that besides the information because you, you, you share this information to the uh, suppliers, to in, to the individual um, household, uh, what is um, uh, in, in demand and what kind of quality of production you, 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 can, uh, you can produce. Do you also have kind of like capacity building to these uh, households and to, to get them aware of how to make their uh, production more um, in line with the uh, like so um, eco uh, standards or uh, like say in line with the demand side do you have this kind of uh, capacity building to them and also uh, or uh, you just um, organize and tell them what to do or have some um, some additional um, capacity building to them I think that will okay. be very um, valuable and we can learn from that thank you Okay, thank you very much. And that's a brilliant uh, question. And uh, on that slide that I showed how a landscape looks like, there is, uh, there is a section on incentives. And yes, capacity building is one of the, of the incentives. So we have a package uh, because we realize, that, like I said, financing alone is not enough because the barriers are many. There's a financial barrier, a technical barrier, a market barrier, and so many other things. So the incentive package that we give also targets capacity building. It targets capacity building. The main strategy that we use is, is called um, uh, self-management. We, we, we empower the communities to self-manage. So that way they need capacity, they need access to information, they need structures, they need decision-making structures, they need uh, feedback and grievance redress mechanisms. So we invest in all those, what we call the social capital for them to be able to address uh, the challenges and for them to be able to make decisions and also the practical capacity building of um, how to manage the land. So we do offer those, those everything as part of um, the incentive models that, that the incentive, the investments in the incentives that we give, yes. Okay, is Dr. Sen is connect is it connected? Hello. Mm. There is also a question in the chat. Yeah. I don't know if I should respond to it. Please go ahead. From Dr. Peng, that where she, where he is asking that is there a specific um mechanism for resource mobilization for Af African IPOCs. Um, from my experience, I have not found that specific um, mechanism, but from what I know is that us as uh, CSOs, we have a responsibility to ensure inclusivity that those that IPOCs are included in those processes, but also within uh, for example, UNFCCC, they are the, the, the Cancun safeguards that um, are supposed to prioritize the, the IPOCs, both in terms of um, do no harm, but also in terms of do good. 
So all those processes, the, the UNFCCC, the SDGs and so on and so forth, within the processes, they provide for the participation of IPLCs. But normally IPLCs are not able to participate because they don't have the capacity. They don't have the capacity to even understand these provisions or these mechanisms. So that's how we come in as um, intermediary organizations to be able to understand the needs of the IPLCs and also understand the requirements of these mechanisms and provide platforms through which those two um, can be met. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. Comparing offsetting, insetting, and offtaking, which do you we, which do you think is the most crucial way for private sector to contribute? to biodiversity and the climate actions? Okay, from, uh, from our experience, we have mobilized a lot more money from the offsetting because I hope I'm still there. <laughs> we, we have mobilized yeah, a lot yeah. more money. Yeah, we have mobilized a lot more money from the offsetting. Just because offsetting, they are, they are mechanisms for quantifying. So it is, it is because of the guidelines under the UNFCCC, it's very easy to, to measure how much a private sector is, is contributing and how much is stored in the land. So that exchange is a lot easier. However, we, there are opportunities everywhere. So it depends on what appeals to private sector. There is private sector that will not offset but because they can see that this is critical to the survival of their supply chain, they will invest. And therefore it would be an inserting model. So it all depends on the, on the value proposition to that private sector. But from our perspective, we have mobilized a lot more financing from the offsetting, thank you. Especially for climate change, because the methodologies and the mechanisms and the means of verification are very clear. So it's a lot easier to sell. Thank you. Um, there is another question from Serena Ann. Is there any potential conflict between climate change and biodiversity? How can you, how can we ensure a holistic approach? Yes, um, there is, there is a, thank you very much for that question. Yes, there is a potential conflict. And like, as I mentioned in my earlier presentation, it's an impact um, it, it's, it's a dependency impact relationship. So if you overutilize, then, then, then the impact happens. But also we have very many experiences where actions that are intended for climate change mitigation end up to be detrimental to biodiversity conservation. For example, uh, a, an, a, an, an area can be very rich in biodiversity but not very heavy in, in, in carbon. So the people who are trying to promote uh, mitigation activities could want to clear a grassland in order to plant trees. So you would have lost biodiversity that is resident in that very rich grassland, but increased, but mitigated climate change. So, so the actions to mitigate climate change uh, end up to end up into making losses for biodiversity conservation. So if you don't target it very well, and also in, in the Cancun guidelines, in the safeguards, there are also environmental safeguards where the, the, some of the considerations that you need to have in mind in order for climate change actions not to result into uh, conservation actions. But yes, it is very easy to achieve one and create losses in the other. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually have a, a small question. How long does it take to develop a successful case like this? I mean, how, how um, long time did you take to, to develop? 